Hello, critical thinkers, and welcome to this newest episode of the Healthy and Awake podcast. I know I've been away for some time. I was in the process of moving. Took longer than expected. Uh, But anyway, we're back. I have a great interview, more like a conversation with a health coaching friend of mine, Laura Timbrook. She's been kind enough to have me on her show in the past. And today in this episode, we had a great conversation uh, about chaos. And, And this is definitely relevant for those who feel like they have some degree of chaos in their lives. Uh, so chaos planning is the title. And there's a lot of great stuff in here about motivation and dealing with the unexpected and all sorts of valuable golden nuggets, you might call them. Uh, so I think you're going to like it. Definitely check out the show notes so you can follow her and let me know what you think in the comments. But without further ado, here we go. Last time we talked about chaos planning Mm -hmm. and then we're here today re-recording it which is kind of appropriate given the chaos so maybe a good place to start is what's chaos planning yeah so chaos planning was kind of something that i created as a result with my clients i was over the years noticing that you know certain things they would do really well until something happened and it was always some form of chaos Kids, sports, maybe, you know, something happened within the family dynamic, someone lost a job, or it was just something simple, like they got a new puppy, you know, but it was always something that threw them off their game. And the problem was, is they couldn't easily get back on track. It was just like this kind of shifting where it it was just really detrimental to what they were really trying to do. And it ended up in frustration. And really the chaos plan came out of that. Like one of the things I go through with all my clients is, okay, what is usually the thing that has stopped you in the past? Sometimes it might be something as simple as I got tired of the food. Um, Other times it's kids sports are always a big one. Heavy work time is another one. So we take these ideas of what really kind of derails somebody. And then we say, okay, when this happens, what are we going to do? We put a contingency plan around it. So it's really kind of a simple concept, but Within my practice, it was really something that I saw success rates drastically increase, like something that people would have success rates, but then maybe they'd come back to me in a year or two saying, hey, you know, I was really doing good until, well, we took away that until. Okay. So chaos, of course, is inevitable. I mean, whether you're a shift worker or not, chaos is going to be there. So having a plan can definitely be valuable and useful. Uh, But you work with mostly shift workers. Is that right? Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So I started actually in corporate wellness and I was doing it through a consulting agency. So they would send me to hundreds of different kinds of clients. And really, probably I'd say at the end, I'd probably say this was probably be around 2015 to 2017 at this point, I started getting into more manufacturing. And it was just kind of the nature of the consulting work. And I started focusing more in factories. And the interesting thing was there was such a polarization between the corporate offices and the manufacturing facilities. And a lot of times the facilities I was in, I would have both. I would have the, the corporate employees and I would have the plant production employees. And it was interesting talking to the different employees, especially when they were back to back. They're 20 minute sessions. And what they struggled with in the corporate office and what they struggled with on the production floor was a bit different. The way I would coach was different. And that's really where I started really focusing on the shift work because I felt like I could do so much more work there. You know, the corporate office staff, a lot of times they've already been exposed to maybe health coaches, dietitians, fitness trainers, things like that. But a lot of the shift workers, they maybe had one experience and it didn't go well. Mm -hmm. And they always felt like, well, the person talking to me doesn't understand my lifestyle and kind of allowing them that space to talk about their lifestyle, to talk about, you know, what a two, two, three shift is and how their, their times that they sleep is always changing and creating a plan that fit them was to me really exciting, but also allowed me to 
kind of branch out and really focus on that bio individuality a little bit more? Yeah, that sounds challenging. And I know firsthand, you know, my dad's a doctor, he works 24 hour shifts, and then he'll work like the next day, he has to work at night again. It's crazy. And so it's like, how do you even sometimes approach something like that, especially when there's so many different things going on between diet and sleep and stress and, and all that. And add on top of that, you as a coach, 20 minutes is, is tight. So did you have any particular like approaches or strategies that yeah, I actually, you know, it's funny now that I've been doing the 20 minute sessions for so long, I actually prefer them. And one of the reasons why I found is when someone's coming to me, that 20 minute sessions, they already know they only have 20 minutes. And for most people, I think we feel the time pressure when we hear 20 minutes, when we hear an hour, it's like, oh, I have an hour to do that. But when you only have 20 minutes, you're more, you're already coming to me a little bit streamlined where it's, it's okay. I have diabetes issue, my movement's my issue. They already have their issues laid out. So we can really get to what they want to do, what they like to do. You know, I always tell somebody when they sit down to me, what are your non-negotiables and give me your three favorite meals? You know, because from that, that's how we're going to quickly build that plan. So it's kind of having those ideas, which we use in the chaos planning, you know, really heavily. It's, I want to know what is your non-negotiables? What is the one thing you love? Like, if you tell me you love steaks and you're thinking about going on a vegan diet, well, let's have this conversation because that might not work out for you real well. Um, but if you want to tell me, hey, I want to be maybe a vegan diet five nights a week or five days a week, well, then that might be something that we can work with. And it's kind of understanding what attracted them to the vegan diet and, and things like that. So I think when we have those 20 minute sessions, Clients already come in much more streamlined on what they want to get out of that session. And the interesting thing is I know a lot of health coaches, we kind of we're always dealing with the excuses. Like I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. Let me tell you, just reducing to 20 minute session really eliminates the excuses. Hmm. That's a good point. And I think it's maybe called Parkinson's law. I, I think that might be it. Maybe not where it's like, it's it'll take you however long you set the deadline for. So if you set like a year to do something, it'll take you a year to do it. If you give yourself a month or a week or whatever, you'll hopefully find a way to get it done more quickly. And so it's kind of interesting how that can apply to both the clients we might work with, but also ourselves as coaches. That's something that kind of universally applies is giving yourself that deadline and you know, that's certainly an aspect of time management, which goes along with with chaos planning. And, yeah, and the uh, interesting thing is to add on to what you're saying there is I've also even seen it where, like, let's say someone wants to go to the gym and they're having difficulties and maybe their next session, they're telling me I didn't get to the gym, but generally they come with with to the session with how they can do it better. Hey, I think this week I'm going to try to do it this way. A lot of times it's not like, I didn't get to the gym, I don't know what to do. And I think those shortened sessions just really kind of allows them to kind of think this through because they know they only have 20 minutes with me and they don't want to waste their time with me trying to brainstorm ideas. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to have to start messing around with that because I usually do like 45 minutes and I, I deal with some talkers, which I love because I'm a talker too, but it definitely... It can be more concise and, and maybe that's something I should mess around with. Uh, but you also mentioned like uh, the vegan diet and, and specific like major changes. I've seen that also as a coach where some people and this is great, like some people very uh, ambitious, real go getters, maybe even sometimes that's not ambition. Sometimes that comes from a place of guilt, like, oh, man, I got a, a lot of catching up to do. So can you go a little more into how you deal with? someone like that who really has a hundred things they want to check off or or maybe even do something that's like me i eat tons of steak so thinking about a vegan diet is is a major change in my schedule if i were to try that yeah i mean i think first we have to find out what attracts them to that is it a news article or you know i've had people come to me that haven't been on a vegetarian or a vegan diet that wanted to go and they told me they actually feel better when they don't eat as much animal protein so it really just depends on where they're coming from with it. 
sometimes they come to me because their neighbor, or their best friend told them, hey, this is the diet they did and they want to try it. And, you know, as coaches and a Mike, I'm sure you're the same way. I'm never going to talk a client out of anything. Like what you want to do is what you do. And we're going to coach you through that. But having that understanding, because I think a lot of times people come to coaches with an idea, but they don't understand really why they want to do something. So it's kind of having that conversation and that kind of goes into chaos planning as well is when we make things more difficult, we kind of create that own chaos. Like let's go back to that vegetarian or vegan diet. Let's say someone came from a very animal centric diet. When you're going to a vegetarian or let's even say a plant forward diet, that's changing your whole repertoire of what you're eating. Now you're eating totally different foods that you haven't before. You're trying to be more creative. So that causes a really big level of stress. So when we try to make these big changes, even though we have good intentions, a lot of times that in itself causes that chaos. So when we're talking about chaos planning, we want to try to avoid or have a plan around the chaos. We don't want to introduce more chaos. So if I would have somebody, let's say, come to me from an animal-centric diet wanting to go more plant forward, you know, we would kind of just shift the plate in the beginning, unless it's some, maybe their heart doctor told them they had to do this, and then that's a whole different story. Um, And with something like that, if you had to make that drastic change, get yourself a cookbook. Like, that's the easiest thing. Like, get yourself a cookbook and meal plan. You don't have to prep, but meal plan, at least have an idea, but it's really kind of understanding that, okay, I have limited time. Maybe the Instapot would be a great idea for you or, you know, roasting a ton of veggies one day a week, who knows, but it's kind of, we want to have that idea and understanding what the end goal is and why we're trying to do it. Um, And I think we actually had this conversation in our first recording, we were talking about the 80, 20 rule. And I think so many times we try to jump in at a hundred percent And 100% for very few people ever works out. When we go, I know a lot of health coaches will say 90-10. I even think 90-10 is real difficult. You know, I'm more on the 80-20. I would even go 70-30. Like 50-50 if that's all you can give. But it's understanding that because if you understand this is all I can give right now, we could still take tiny steps forward instead of going backwards. Yeah, that's great. And and the 80-20 rule generally, you know, 70-10 or 70-30. Um so so important because you see that everywhere, even beyond just like our our habits and things that we do, you see it in in even like finances. You'll see the 80-20 rule. Uh and people don't like the idea of just completely giving something up or or making these radical shifts and and I even mentioned last time with it in the original recording how I, I love sugar and all of us, most of us health coaches, we get into health coaching because we've conquered some kind of health challenge or we have a health condition and we try to help other people with that condition. One of the things out of the many that got me into health coaching is not only struggling with my own sugar addiction, really, uh, but also conquering it to some extent. And I've noticed how the 80 20 rule definitely helps. Uh, And even for myself and other people, I've noticed how, uh, unfortunately, major paradigm shift moments in our lives can really shift changes in a major way, like the death of a family member or some kind of tragedy, like a divorce or, or something else. And I'd spent a lot of time thinking about that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, how when something like that happens, I feel like we start asking ourselves questions. We start really looking at the world in a different way and because we're kind of forced to in, in those situations. And the beauty of health coaching, at least in part, is that we can ask people similar questions or questions with a similar effect without somebody having to die or without, you know, having to go through a divorce. Does that make sense? Or what do you think about that? Absolutely. You know, and what you're bringing up is really about those priorities. Like, what are we prioritizing? Are we prioritizing a healthy diet or a rigorous workout routine in place of spending time with friends and family and enjoying things that 
you want to be doing. And I think this is, you know, it's a big conversation to have. And it's interesting because I think, you know, I hate to say the C word, but COVID brought this out for a lot of people is really realigning those priorities. We realized that you know, work was important, but it wasn't more important than time with the family. When all of a sudden that we're forced to look at that, our time with our family, our friends, it might be reduced. And you really started reprioritizing that. And that's something that you have to have those conversations with your health coach. And you're right. You know, you don't want to wait to a death or a major life event to reprioritize what you need to do. It's essential that we kind of have that sense of well-being and well-being and more of just, I think a lot of times we think of it as food and fitness, but just that overall happiness. And I think that's important. And that goes back to kind of that 80-20 rule is you can't be so strict. And I see so many times where we get so strict on things and we have these big workout like morning routine lists and it just creates so much more stress where do we really need it? And that's where that conversation of prioritization and what is your goal like is your goal to be in the kitchen 90 percent of your time making the world's best food or is it to be outside in nature spending time with your family and just making memories like what where's your where's your priority for sure and again that's another beauty of health coaching is that I think different people would answer different things. Some people would say, hey, I do want to spend all day in the kitchen. I love being in the kitchen. And someone else might say, hey, my family drives me nuts, which, which I'm just joking there. But um, that made me think of this clip, which I, I know you've seen before. Uh, but let me play this now just to kind of, uh, I think this goes perfectly along with what you just said. You know, I don't know if I'm living sometimes or if I'm doing a to-do list. And then I don't know whose to-do list it is sometimes. I don't know if it's my own things that I want to be doing. Is it things that I feel like people want me to be doing? Like whose expectations am I living up to? I'll make this personal. Do you ever feel like that? Oh, my God. Every time, you know, I have three teenagers and it, it's funny because you feel like you have these expectations. I have to I have to do so much. And it's just like, well, am I doing this because other moms in the school are doing this or am I doing this because this is what I want to do? And I've really I've had this conversation with myself a million different times. And it's just. I think it's something really good to ask. And it's actually probably something I'm going to start asking my clients because um, I think it's it's powerful to understand, is this an expectation that we're putting on ourselves or is this something you really want to do? You know, it's, it's interesting. We've been having this whole um, kind of movement of accepting different bodies and accepting who, where we are and everything like that. And it's, it's interesting because it brings up this point that I think a lot of times we think we have to have the big beach muscles if we're a guy or we think we have to be a certain size as a as a female. And I think it's really how many times have we ever asked ourselves if that's what we want or if that's just the expectation? I know I'm going to go down a rabbit hole here for a second. Or is that the expectation society has put onto us? in thinking this is what we want. And I see this a lot of times with clients that'll come to me that will want to lose weight. And you kind of are trying to find out, okay, well, what's their motivation around it? And it's like, well, my husband wants me to lose weight or this person wants me to lose weight or my kids want me to lose weight. And it's like, but do you want to lose weight? Like, is that, and I can't tell you how many times someone has looked at me and says, I do, I just don't know if I have the bandwidth right now to handle it. Yeah. And that's, that's mind blowing. For sure. And and social media has made that so much worse where we're constantly exposed to different people doing different things. And of course, all the most like eye catching things are put in front of us. And so it can create this distorted reality of of what things are really like, what people are really like, what people are really doing. And 
and you only see a fraction, really a few seconds of that window. You're only peering through the window for just a few seconds when really you don't see maybe the struggle or the the cheat codes that they use to get to that point or or any of that. And it and it can really mess with your head to the point where you see especially young people with eating disorders in the fitness industry. It's been totally corrupted to the point where I see this all the time, where if you don't do drugs, you're somehow a loser. If you're not taking steroids, you're you're weak and and it it's there's a lot of good from social media for sure. But it's really, I think, done a lot of damage and created more chaos for people in, in many different ways. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing is, is going back to social media. And I know we talked about this on the original podcast when we recorded is, you know, just I like when podcasts or social media, whatever platform they're on, call it out, like call it out. I know we went through this this past year with the Liver King, right? We all realized that this guy was all juiced up and he, it wasn't just antler testicle or uh, elk testicles not antler testicles i don't think <laughs> antlers have testicles <laughs> but um <laughs> you know we started realizing this and there's um uh youtuber i follow uh more plates more dates or something mm -hmm. like that where he really kind of calls out and i think even in like the movie industry and stuff like that we have to be honest we see these superheroes on tv and everyone's like, no, 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 this is all diet and exercise. You know what? Stop lying to us because there is a 16-year-old boy sitting in his bedroom trying to be Chris Helmsworth or Hemsworth and thinking that if he does this this way, he can be this. You're lying to him. And the effect that has on the mental well-being of a developmental brain, we kind of stop this. And... I think for years we always thought it was like a female thing because it was the Vogue magazines and the Cosmopolitans and all of this. But we're realizing, no, I, I deal with a lot of my clients are males. It's the same thing, but it's not so much weight wise. Well, it is in a way because it's muscle. It's how how big are you? How strong are you? It's it's just different, but it's the same thing. Yeah. And and it really, this is kind of related. It makes me think of toxic people because in our own immediate areas, if we have toxic people around us, to a fair extent, we can kind of get rid of them and, and get them out of our lives. And it seems like continually when we open up social media, we're inviting toxic people and toxic ideas into our homes where otherwise we wouldn't do that. And it's funny how whenever, I, I love talking about uh, toxic exposure as an education topic within coaching because we could talk about sleep and food and all these different things but i just love talking about toxic exposure and so when i ask them what do you already know about toxic exposure i'd say nine out of ten people the first thing they say is toxic people which always blows me away because i mean for me i'm thinking of like the poisons they're putting in our food but uh, toxic people, I guess we all kind of have a toxic person, whether it's a friend or a family that we just can't get rid of, even if we want to. But social media seems like one of those things that we can really have a lot of control over to eliminate some toxic ideas because we can really curate our feed and, and be very careful about who we follow and all that. Yeah, and I think that's really important. And I'll tell you something that I, um, I tell a lot of my clients that will come to me and we'll have that conversation about you know toxic family members or toxic toxic friends and the big thing i tell them is you know toxic people are toxic people regardless if they're friends or family and i think a lot of times we ha hold this guilt that we have to be around somebody because of who they are you know maybe they're a parent a friend a brother a sister who knows but they're still toxic and it's okay to walk away from that the same way you would walk away from a toxic chemical, a toxic coworker, you know, just because they have this relationship doesn't mean that you have to abide by the toxicity. And, you know, I love the fact that a lot of your clients are bringing that up because I totally would have gone with like the chemicals in food too. Yeah. And it's, it's not always clear cut. And, and obvious with, it, you know, like how you say with the family members, because this is something I've personally dealt with 
uh, having toxic people in my life that can be tricky to distance myself from. And a weird thing that happened is I, I have no problem making the decision. Hey, this person's toxic. I'm going to stay away from them, even if they're family, as cold as that might sound. And I, I did that. And it got to a point where this person, they were improving themselves. They were trying to be less toxic for whatever reason. And I, I still was just trying to be cautious and keep my distance. And it got to a certain point where I think they were trying to make amends so much that I started to feel like the toxic person just by keeping my distance. Oh, man. So it's really like a, a balancing act. There's no not always a clear cut way to approach this sort of thing, which again goes back to having someone to to talk about this sort of thing and to do the chaos planning and and uh, coaching can be so valuable in that way. Yeah. And, you know, just to kind of go back what what you said that there a second ago, you know, the person themselves doesn't have to necessarily be toxic. Maybe it's just the environment. We see this a lot of times, especially with the holidays, you know, someone's going, two people are going to dinner at grandma's house. One person is on one side of the political fence. The other person is on the other side of the political fence. And that environment of talking about that is toxic. And it's not so much that the person is toxic. It's just that your viewpoints might not match up. Maybe you can't accept it or they can't accept it. And it's just that environment with those two people is toxic. So it's not that you have to avoid that person. Maybe it's just you have to avoid a certain topic. And I think that was a really good point that you made. And sometimes it's not so cle clear cut on that person is toxic. There's a lot of things that come into place, but tying that into the chaos planning, absolutely. Because again, you need to know if that's going to throw you off on your game. If you know that I'm going to go see this person, and this is a big one for a lot of people. And I'm glad you brought this up is a lot of times people will throw them off their, their game. You know, somebody, maybe you're seeing somebody that you just, you've been stressing out about and now it's throwing you off on whatever behavior you're try trying to change. And you kind of get wrapped up in this and you don't know how to get off of it. And, you know, the one thing I tell a lot of my clients that kind of get into this mindset, maybe they're going through something difficult. Maybe there are the holidays. A lot of holidays are a big one for a lot of people. You know, give yourself grace during that. You know what? If you're not eating the best or working out the best in the month of December, it's okay. You have January. You have November. You can kind of go around it. We don't have to be, again, going back to that 80 20, we don't have to be perfect all the time. And maybe 10 months out of the year, you're great. Two months out of the year, not so much. It's okay. That's all in the 80-20 rule. Yeah. And you have to wonder if if somebody did check off all the boxes, when you when you look at all the different areas of health, spiritual, financial, uh, nutritional health, like all the aspects, if someone was a 10 out of 10 in every category, you have to wonder how even relatable or personable they would be. And it makes me think of, I, I saw your comment this morning on the, the thing that I posted, how uh, one thing that seems to have been lost in society is this ability to just disagree with somebody and still get along with them. And that definitely speaks to the mental health component of things where it seems, I think because of that, because we have lost this ability to disagree with people, I think it's made a lot of us very fragile, which you know what i think that's a, a, an important part of chaos planning cuz you can plan for all sorts of things around chaos but i think we should also try to strengthen ourselves and become as anti-fragile as we can because we can plan all day and things still might not go according to plan and then what happens when the chaos presents itself we lose our minds or we might push people away or get angry and disagree with people. And, and it can just really wreak havoc on our lives and just add chaos. Yeah. And that's why we, a lot of times we will talk about giving ourselves some grace. Like it's just, there is times, you know, let's say you're on the best eating plan. You've been doing great. Something happens and you have no time. Maybe you forgot to go food shop. Maybe you came back from vacation because this has just happened to me today. You came back from vacation. And your fridge is empty. 
you know what? It's okay to order the pizza. Like it's okay. And giving yourself that grace to say, well, I was going to come back on vacation and day one, I was going to be doing good. Well, I set myself up for failure. I should have known I cannot come back from vacation and day one expect me or my kids to have like the great breakfast we normally have or to have any of this. It's just not realistic. Who who went shopping? Like, do I have gnomes in my house that are going shopping when I'm gone? Because I don't. So I think it's setting those expectations and just giving ourselves a little bit of grace. You know what? Sometimes chaos comes and, you know, a lot of times even when we're working with a chaos plan with a client, we'll say, okay, here's good, better, best what is it? And sometimes it's just, listen, we're ordering pizza. We're going to go hit Chick-fil-A through the drive-thru. We are going to get Panera. We are, you know, whatever it is, it's just allowing yourself that ability to choose and not feel guilty. I think that's the big part of chaos planning is eliminating that guilty component because so many times we feel guilty and there's no reason to feel guilty. Shit happens to everybody. Yeah, definitely. And I personally have been there myself. And and for me, it's it can go either way. If I'm eating pizza or ice cream or whatever it is, I'm not feeling guilty. I'm enjoying the hell out of it for sure. But it's when I get carried away, I get comfortable in that space, which can be so easy for me at least. And and I know other people as well, where I give myself that that like, hey, let's just have a pizza. It's fine. And then the next day it's like, what's What's one more whole large pizza? I mean, it's just one more and then it just repeats and repeats and, and it can be uh, definitely tricky because I mean, they're designed to be enjoyable, of course. And yeah, that's, and, and I, I've mentioned this before, how like sugar is, is something that really as a coach, even I struggle with, but I've noticed like I've been a lot better lately and it does affect to a high degree, my decision making, my ability to deal with the chaos, um, to be motivated or productive at all. And it's the same, not only with food, if I really go down a bad path with my food, same thing with sleep, stress. So if we don't keep those things in check, they can really just create more chaos. Is there anything you see with the people that you work with that? stands out the most because i would guess with shift workers it sleep maybe sleep is a big one and food is a big one like those two and you know what exercise it's funny because now we're gonna go <laughs> you know i would say out of all of that the ones that are good with sleep are good with sleep um most of them though struggle they think like four or five hours is okay and they don't realize what it's like to you know Think about this. You have your homeostasis line. Let's say for the last seven years, you have been sleeping four to five hours a night. Well, when you feel good, you think you feel good. Like this is what feeling good is like. But then let's say for one week, you decide, you know what? I'm going to give myself eight hours of sleep. Well, your level of good has now changed. And it's like, well, wait a second. Now I feel really good. And I think a lot of times we see this and the same things with diets and exercise and is, you know, I always challenge somebody, let's, let's push yourself on one end and see if you feel any better. You know, when it comes to sleep, I don't think anybody has ever told me that they were still good on five hours as if they were going with seven or eight hours. I don't think I've ever had somebody, I've had people that are like, nope, I can do four hours and I will sleep when I'm dead. And, you know, but then we challenge them a little bit. Let's see what happens when we get six hours. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, I noticed got a little bit more done than I normally do. Or maybe they suddenly had time to go to the gym. Um, I think that's a big one. Food is a big one because food for, especially our night shifters, because food's not easily readily available. You figure if we come off work and let's say work was hectic. And I say we as in somebody that works a nine to five job, work was hectic. You can hit. Chick-fil-A, get a better option. You can hit Panera, get a better option. You have all these other options that, okay, if I can't go home and make dinner, you get off at work at like 6 a.m., you have McDonald's and a gas station. So food can be really difficult because there is a bigger prep time. There's more to consider. So that 
can be another issue. But, you know, one that's been popping up a lot lately and it's kind of not been on my radar for for a little while is exercise. And I think because of COVID, we've realized how important it is to work out and, you know, working out our cardiovascular system. So now everyone that's kind of like on the forefront of everybody's mind. But yet when you're a nurse and you have been running around all day and now you're off a 14 hour shift and it's like, okay, I got to get my cardio in with what energy? Mm. And that's been another big one. It's kind of teaching people that, okay, if you have a busy on the run, you know, I'm sure your dad has had the same thing. You're running around, you're running around, you know, their exercise plan might not be cardiovascular. Their exercise plan might be yoga, breathing, Tai Chi, something to calm them. And I think it's understanding that. And that's what I see a lot with shift work. It's we have to take the mainstream media on what we think is healthy and really change it to fit their lifestyle because it's not a one for one. I had a few thoughts with some of the, the stuff that you said there, and that was all great. And it made me think uh, around exercise, how if you look in in some of the I think they call them like the blue zones where the people are centenarians. They live over a hundred years. They're not doing heavy deadlifts and throwing heavy weights over their heads and doing all that. And, and that goes back to how this, the, the fitness culture in, in the States has become so distorted from what we really need. And, and even as a content creator, I, I think about this because if I were to put like just exactly what you like some of the foundational stuff for fitness nobody's watching that it's boring as hell and so that's why you see tons of stuff on instagram of people like one-legged squats on a on like a dangerous like it's just crazy some of the stuff that people do and then that inspires people but when you look at some of those blue zones i mean they're doing like what you said they're doing yoga and tai chi and all these gentle movements and they're living for a hundred plus years so it really i think speaks to i you know just the tailoring things to to your lifestyle and and we don't need to be throwing heavy weights i mean i love throwing heavy weights around but uh it's definitely not for everybody but the the other thing that came up was acclimation how we can be so comfortable in in something how we can really develop a routine around it whether that's four hours of sleep and yeah i can function just fine and we change it smoking is is the same way i've uh, helped people quit smoking and you know somebody could smoke for 10 years hey i feel fine i wake up every day i do the things that i'm supposed to do and then they quit smoking and it's literally like a fog has been lifted and they can think clearly and get all these things done. One more thing that came up was uh, motivation. How, uh, I, I don't remember exactly why this came up in, in what you said, but we can make significant changes when we're really inspired in some way or we really feel like some pressure. And a silly example of that is the ps5 i don't know can you hear that car alarm going off no i'm good okay. i don't my, hear it at my, all my neighbor's car alarm. um but the ps5 when the the ps5 came out i saw all kinds of uh my friends younger people who i know are broke don't have a lot of money and they say hey the ps5 they i mean they did jobs that i never thought they would do they're picking up side work they're putting themselves further into debt, which maybe isn't the best move. But when somebody really wants something, they'll find a way to go and do it. And so it's interesting how sometimes you'll see that develop naturally as a coach where maybe somebody struggles with something and they experience something in their lives where they come back and like, oh my God, I, I met this one person or I saw this video or I did this thing and, and it really inspired me to make all these changes. So I, I just think between acclimating to uncomfortable circumstances and finding spontaneous motivation that can completely change our lives and all these different things. The mind is so powerful. Oh, absolutely. And you know, that motivation, I'm glad you brought that up because I think a lot of times we miss this. We, we go for, well, I just need the willpower. No, no, no. We don't need willpower. Willpower might get us started. 
you know, it might be the like the the initial tick that kind of pushes us. But if we don't have motivation, that willpower is going to die out. So if I have somebody that comes to me and it's like, you know, I just don't have the willpower to keep it up. In my head, I'm hearing, I don't want it. Like, I really don't want this. Because it's so much more than just willpower that we need. And I love the fact that you brought up, you know, about the PS5. Because, yeah, like, if we really want something, we can get it. I had, um, I was watching one of these business uh, videos a while ago and somebody was saying that they wanted to start a business but they needed two thousand dollars and they just didn't have it and they didn't think starting the business was relevant and the one financial advisor was like you need you're telling me you can start a business and all you need is two thousand dollars he's like you can't find two thousand dollars in your basement on facebook marketplace he's like i can guarantee you could probably five five thousand dollars and he's like how bad do you want it? And I think that really comes down to it. You know, if at the PS5, if we really want that, how bad do we really want that? And I think that motivation you were talking about is exactly it. You know, do you really, this goal you laid out, do you want it? And what do you want it for? Because I think a lot of times people, it's just, oh, I want this goal, but do you really want it? Going back to that video we want, we watched a second ago or a couple minutes ago, are you doing this because you want to, or are you doing this because someone else wants you to do it? Yeah. How can we harness that PS5 energy? And that makes me think of, you, you know, I speak a lot about uh, marketing, like corporate marketing and how people influence us. And so you think about the PS5, I think you can get all these people to just totally change their routines and make sacrifices and sometimes act like maniacs to get this PS5. In a sense, it's like we're being played by these companies. How can we turn that around on ourselves? And, and how can we influence ourselves the same way that Sony can so powerfully influence all these young folks to, to really go out of their way? And it, I think it's worth the self-reflection to, like, to really put that on ourselves. So maybe for, for somebody listening to this, it's not a PS5, but I would imagine that there's something out there that would motivate us on that level to really just without even thinking make sacrifices and sell the stuff in our basement or whatever it is and so sometimes i think around chaos planning you know maybe that might even create more chaos and and like how do i get past that i don't know it's just something to think about i guess well, and I think it's an interesting point, too, there is that, yeah, it might create chaos, but is it really chaos if it's something we want? Is it willing to work through it? And I think a lot of times that's the big thing. You know, I, there was this moment in my career where, you know, I just became newly board certified and, you know, I was sitting at um, it was a manufacturing facility. It was a really old school manufacturing facility. It was all male. They were all 60 plus. And um, we were sitting there and one guy, he had his uh, blood sugar taken and his blood sugar was really high. And um, we were, he was talking to the nurse and the nurse sent him over to the health coach. She's like, we got to talk about some behavior changes with this. And he sat down, he wanted nothing to do with it, like nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just kind of removed the conversation and we started, we were both big campers. So we started talking about camping and he was telling me all the places he's camped, he's camped with his kids when they were growing up. And now he's starting to have grandchildren and he can't wait to take them camping. And I kind of, because as a health coach, you kind of sometimes can't let something go. Um, we circled back to his blood sugar. I said, you know, where do you see yourself in five years if you don't get control of your blood sugar? And he kind of took a minute. And for those of you who haven't taken the, the, um, the health coach exam. This is called motivational interviewing, where you kind of do this self-reflection question on somebody. So it was just something I kind of just learned about. So I was like, ah, oh, let's try it here because this guy really does not want to change at all. And um, he's like, well, you know, my mom had diabetes. She lost the toe. She ended up dying young um, through heart complications. And I was like, wait a second, you're telling me you're so excited about 
grandkids and camping and all this wonderful things. And now you're telling me that if you don't get control of your blood sugar in five years, you're going to lose a limb and maybe die because you don't want to eat a vegetable. And he looks at me, goes, well, I guess that's pretty dumb, isn't it? And I was like, yeah, it does sound pretty dumb. And it was funny because in that conversation, he totally changed because I don't think it was ever presented to him that, listen, all those things you love are going to be gone if you don't. And he ended up over the years, he lost like 80 pounds. He was, it, it, it really changed. And it was funny because I was like right at the beginning of me being board certified. I was like, wow, that question really does work. And now my favorite people to work with are the ones that are not ready to change because a lot of times, even though they're not ready to change, they're one of the easiest I have found to change if you ask the right question. I completely agree. And the challenging ones are my favorite too. And I really believe that on some level, the people holding beliefs or ideas or realities in their heads like that. I think they know them. Maybe it's denial that, you know, hey, I, it's rolling around in the back of my head that if I don't make these changes, they're going to cut off my legs or I could have a heart attack and die early or, or whatever it is. But it's only when we articulate it that we're forced, especially to another person, another human being, that we're forced to confront those harsh realities. And I, I've seen it a few times myself where as soon as it's said out loud, you can almost see it in their eyes where something just totally shifts. It's, it's so rewarding as a coach to, to be able to help people in that way. Yeah. Um, and you know, the interesting thing is I think a lot of times we, the way health and wellness has been presented to a lot of people, they feel, this is what I've found working with the shift workers, is they feel left out of the conversation. And it's just like, well, healthy doesn't work for me. I can't tell you how many times I've heard the phrase healthy doesn't work for me. And I think it's just because how we're presenting the information. Like, can we present it in a way that would be more attractive to somebody in their 60s that love camping and is a welder by trade? Rather than I find a lot of the health and wellness information is really set up for someone that lives in a suburban city area that works a nine to five job and is in their 20 and thirties. Like it's just not set up. And I think that's where as health coaches, we have to be cognizant of that. And how can we, because I don't think I would have gotten any of the results I got with him if I didn't like camping, like anything Mm. else. I don't know if it would have connected. And I think that's where, you know, having that understanding of, who our clients are. And I think as health coaches, we have a good understanding of that. I know what you mean. It's about finding common ground. And and I'm sure even if you couldn't connect, let's say you didn't like camping, I'm sure as the good coach you are, you'd be able to find something else to connect. And that really does help because I've worked with people who, and this is fine, this is reasonable, but we talk and they just don't vibe with me at all. They, I mean, I'm a, a particular type of person. I, I can be very direct. I'm not exactly soft spoken and so some people you know they meet me and i'm i'm not for them that's fine but there are definitely people where either immediately or after a few minutes of talking where we find some kind of common ground and that really does set the scene because i mean you don't want to talk to somebody you just have no connection to or nothing to relate to whatsoever i mean i don't see any value maybe coming from that no and i think that's why i think the health coach world is so cool I think as health coaches, we have to start embracing a little bit more. I know for a long time, I kind of fought that. I felt like I had to fit in this little health coach mold where, you know, I ate kale and quinoa and, you know, cashew cheese was my favorite. And um, I don't like any of that. And, you know, I kind of started embracing who I was and I found my tribe doing it. And I think it's important because, yeah, if I have someone that comes to me and they're more on the, I want to make my own food. I want to, you know, homeschool my kids. Awesome. Great. I'm not the coach for you. I have plenty of coaches that I can give you. And I think that's, that's the power of being a health coach because we can say, Hey, listen, I might not be the health coach for you. You know, your 
your dad who's a welder who doesn't want to change his blood sugar, I might be the health coach to get him to do it. And it's just, it's understanding that and um, embracing it. And I think over the years, I finally started to say, no, I'm going to embrace this. I'm not going to, not going to change anymore. Yeah. And I think that's so valuable too, is having a, a distinct personality because as things become more uh, robotic and automated and all that, I think the ones that come out ahead, the ones that help the most people are going to be the ones that actually have a personality. And I know a lot of just uh, general people interested in health listen to this show, but also some health coaches. And so I hope the health coaches that do hear this uh, maybe differentiate themselves a little bit because it does seem like a lot of the people talking about health and health coaching, it's a lot of the it's a lot of health coaches talking to other health coaches about health coaching with no variation whatsoever. No, you know, it's just, here's, here's the salad that I recommend. And, and it could just be so boring and lifeless. And I think people want the personality. That's what people really are attracted to. I mean, everybody knows that they should do certain things for their health, but I think it's really like, Hey, this is me. This is who I am. And, and when people identify that, I think that's where the magic is. Yeah, I mean, we see that, you know, it's funny because Joe Rogan, he gets somebody on there talking about diets. And now all of a sudden you got a whole platform of people that were not caring about their health suddenly listening to it. And it's just it's different. It's something new, something that they can relate to. So I think it is important that, you know, I, I see that um, I have a, a course for health coaches to teach them to work with ship workers. And I can't tell you how many nurses have taken my course and have come back to me and said, I had no idea. Like, I could just health coach nurses. I could just health coach this, you know, these people I've worked with for so long. I thought I had to coach young moms. I'm like, you don't have to coach young moms. You don't have to do hormones. Like, there is something else. You don't have to do weight loss. Um and I think that's the power is really kind of embracing our uniqueness. And I, I'm kind of excited to see how the health coaching world grows now that we have so many different people coming into the field. Definitely. I completely agree. What else did we not talk about that maybe we should, whether it's around chaos planning or otherwise? You know, I just think, you know, kind of going back to what we were talking about, giving yourself a little bit of grace and giving your clients a little bit of grace, I think sometimes as health coaches, when our clients, well, let's rephrase that. When we don't think our clients are succeeding, we then say it's because of I might not be a good coach or our clients don't want this enough. I think we just have to give everybody some grace and realize that sometimes life sucks, shit happens, and, you know, it's okay to roll with it. Getting them back on the horse or us getting back on the horse, you know, you kind of talked about it a little bit and I always make a joke out of it. You know, just because we fall off the wagon doesn't mean the whole caravan has to roll over us. You know, because you had pizza one night doesn't mean that it's all screw it. I can have pizza the next five nights in a row. Like we have the option to make a better choice the next choice. We don't have to wait to the next Monday or the next day or whatever you know, confines we have put this around. And I think if we could give ourselves more grace, I think we would do so much better reaching our goals than just feeling guilty and feeling like we're failures. Beautifully said, and probably the perfect place to end this. So Laura, where can people find more about you or, or find where to work with you? Yeah, they can go to lauratimbrook.com. I'm sure you're going to put the links in the show notes. And everything's right there. If you're somebody that's looking for a health coach and you kind of relate to me, um, you can book appointments, a free 15-minute consult. Or if you're a health coach and you're really looking to how you could better support shift working professionals, you can download the course right there. And it's 3CE approved through the NBHWC. So you can even get your CEs through there as well. And to anyone listening, I would highly recommend checking that out. Laura's a good friend. She's really good at what she does. She's the best. And uh, thanks for listening. Stay healthy and stay awake.